What is up, everybody? We are back again. How are you guys doing? Jeff, I, you've said earlier, this is your third time on the show this year, uh, which is pretty cool. But, I mean, I'll, I'll say because we've talked about it already. This is the first time we've done it together. I know. Coincidentally, it's, it's your show. And the two times I've stepped in before, it was with Savannah. So it's good to, it's good to be on the virtual stage here with you, Steph. And Gabriel. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I guess yeah, so, you yeah, got welcome. a new entry. Yeah. <laughs> first time on the show. So yeah, welcome guys. No, this will be fun. It's uh we've got some exciting topics to talk about today, everyone. And uh before we start, we've got a couple of programming announcements. We'll get these out the way super quick. So to start off with, I am doing a live stream on the I never get my left and right on this stupid thing. There, build on live, 28th of September, live stream on Twitch. Uh we're gonna throw the link up and there is a way that you can sign up on YouTube so you can get notified and can't wait to do that. Can have loads of amazing technical guests. So make sure that you sign up for that. Alongside that, um, our lovely guest, Jeff, has recently done a lot of this kind of content. Uh, and so you've been on, on YouTube with John Meyer and you've done a blog. Do you want to quickly summarize what kind of stuff you've been doing? Yeah, last month I did two separate podcasts, which end up YouTube videos with, with John Meyer, one about estimating cloud costs and one about budgeting and forecasting cloud costs. And then I also wrote a blog, I believe published Tuesday for the AWS developer relations team about why engineers hold the keys to smart cloud spending. So trying to flex a little bit of that Steph muscle on content and content creation. So yeah, it's been fun though. Really enjoyed it. And I read the title and I was like, did you mean to say the word keys as a secret branding to this? <laughs> it's a nice tie in, right? <laughs> yeah. Cross branding. That's what we aim for. OK, awesome. All right. So let's get into the normal show. So welcome, everyone, to the keys to AWS optimization, the show where we share stories, concepts and solutions to help you unlock your spend at AWS. My name is Stephanie Gooch and I'm a senior commercial, no, senior optimization architect. Damn, still got to get that change right. A senior optimization architect in the optics team, bringing you lots of content in the world of CFM. As you can see, we have two amazing guests. Uh, Jeff, you've been on before, so do you want to just introduce yourself quickly and then we'll give Gabriel time to do his origin story. Yes, I'm Jeff Bloom. I'm a senior optimization solutions architect, also on the optics team. Glad to be here. Oh, awesome. And Gabriel, let's give us your one minute origin story. Thank you. And hi, everyone. I'm Gabriele Marchetti, and uh, I'm a senior business development manager uh, within AWS, specifically focused on the cloud economics. So we are a team within AWS that works with customers in kind of building business cases and trying to understand the value in moving to AWS. I've been in Amazon for, for a while, like more than six, seven years, and then consulting before, always around business performances and how to manage uh, the space of improving and building business cases. Awesome. And as you might infer, we are talking about business cases. So building a business case and how that kind of relates to FinOps and cloud financial management. And so if you're out there today thinking you want to migrate more applications to the cloud, you want to migrate to the cloud and you want to learn a little bit about how to do that, we've got Gabriel in to come and do that. He works with customers every day. And Jeff has done this a lot with customers. So we're going to bring in some awesome stories. So to kick us off, um, Gabriel, do you want to chat a little about a little bit about the cloud value framework that we use for this kind of thing? Yeah, that's the magic framework. Everything rotates around that. And actually, Steph, I don't know if you want to put like the the, the slide on, but um, basically, this is the framework that we use within AWS really to work with customers to build kind of comprehensive business cases that can compare end-to-end on-premises costs and benefits to a potential uh, AWS cloud solutions. And uh, as you can see on the screen, we really have like five pillars. We try to keep it as simple as possible that uh, we will go through the, through each pillar during this, this uh, discussion. And each of the pillar is aiming at kind of comparing potential benefits and savings uh, when you are kind of wondering, okay, how, like, what should they consider 
when I'm considering a move to, to AWS, right? And so, um, Steph, probably we can start by double clicking into, um, into each pillar. And yeah. so, um, let's start with the first one. Probably it's, it's the most common, which is around like cost savings, right? And cost savings, what we mean with cost savings and what you need to keep in mind when you are trying to build a business case for moving to the cloud, um, cost savings are pretty tough pillar to assess just because there are a lot of hidden costs typically within the, the on-prem, right? So if I have to summarize it quickly, the way to to build like a business case that is comprehensive around the cost saving component, you need to start to first of all um, build like your as is costs. So mm -hmm. what is your baseline of the costs? So uh, um, and of course the first easy element is how much you spend for the infrastructure. But then there are a lot of other elements that you need to keep in mind when trying to build your running costs, right? Yes, of course, there are the infrastructure component, but then there are a bunch of what we call it more like hidden costs that are rotating around uh, the maintenance of your infrastructure, all the power and cooling costs, all the elements around, uh, um, you know, like the facilities, the renting. And so like all the elements that you need to keep in mind to build the ASIS cost. And then when you're wondering, okay, how do I compare my running cost, um, my running cost to AWS, is mm -hmm. like you should take into account like a couple of levers that you can pull in order to to optimize the the cost and to think about how to project those. One is of course like when you think about the cloud, there is one big shift that you're moving from a capacity model. So when mm -hmm. you procure your infrastructure for like three to five years ahead of your demand and you're moving to a consumption type of model. So the agility of having, um, you know, like a better, uh, um, a better like spend that is matching your actual demand rather than having to procure ahead of time for a future yeah. demand that is already bringing like kind of really um, a bunch of improvement already straight away. And mm -hmm. then, there are another couple of components that, of course, of course, come with moving to um, a modernized type of environment, right? A really, mm -hmm. uh, really optimized and, and with, with like fresh new infrastructure that you can leverage. You can turn it on, turn it off, depending on your demand. And that's really one of the uh, um, one of the, the key benefits, the benefits that you should take into account. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just jumping in on that. Oh, two things before I forget. Well, one thing uh, in the chat. I've got to say, please feel free, comment, ask questions. We're here to help. And if you need anything from us in general, feel free to email us cost optimization at amazon.com. Uh, I forgot to say that at the start. I uh, just wanted to get into the business case chat so quickly. Uh, so focusing, kind of going in a little bit more about what you're saying about cost optimization. So or cost saving, I guess to summarize, one of the big things is that when you are building this business case, showcasing that there is a saving to be had is a big part of that. And so maybe Jeff, when you've spoken to customers about migrating and building this business case, focusing on cost optimization, what are some of the big hitters that you normally try and bring up in that conversation? Yeah, I, I think that it, it kind of comes in two folds when we talk about cost savings, like the first go around, I try to do more of the, what I'll consider the low hanging fruit. So talk about reserved instances and, and savings plans and the things that are a little bit more easy to quantify. And we go through that as like a first pass of this is how much you'll save from doing this and having these commercial levers. And then once you get a good understanding or really once like to me, the intersection of FinOps comes in is when they actually move over to AWS and then mm -hmm. you see how the application runs, you see how the workload runs, you've already done some modeling, some understanding of this is how it's going to behave. Then you go into more of those technical levers, more, some things that require more viewing or more monitoring of how it's going to run on AWS. And then you go through mm -hmm. and then maybe you look and see, maybe you thought you needed all extra larges on those instance <laughs> types, but you see now that based on the utilization, you can bump those down, you can optimize that. Things like that. So taking that first pass with the cost savings when you actually migrate over and then taking a second pass once you're on mm -hmm. AWS. And then, of course, FinOps is an ongoing journey and it's something that you keep doing and, and kind of evolving and going through 
on a, on a journey that can take, I don't know, months, years, like it's, it's never ending. So you just want to consistently go through and, and do those optimization okay. opportunities when you can. Mm -hmm. And I might act as a, a bit of a devil's advocate in today's call, um, today's session, is one thing that often happens is when people are pitched on migrating, they're sold, everything is like so much cheaper in the cloud. It's like a magical place where everything's really inexpensive. And if you build correctly, that can be the case. It can be really optimized. It can be a lot cheaper, but it does depend on that build case. So when you're building this business case, it's like Jeff said, Make sure that in that you have those kind of mechanisms maybe put in place, I would add, so that you could say, we will have this review happen every quarter, every month to check how we're doing. As well, things like commitments, such as savings plans or reserved instance purchases. People kind of say from the start, oh, yeah, we're definitely going to cover everything in savings plans and it's going to be really cheap because we'll get a discount. But what they don't take into consideration is the process to buy new ones, to review that. They think about buying it as one giant piece of commitment rather than staircasing it granularly. So just as a, another element to it, focus on how you implement those savings across time, not that it's just going to be cheaper from the start. So I'll bring up that slide again, just so, we, so we've covered uh, cost saving. So should we move to staff productivity? Yes, the second, the second part. So um, here really the, the focus is to start to think about what is your current cost and labor costs around running your current infrastructure and how much that can be enhanced by moving to the cloud. And really, there are a couple of KPIs really you should think about, for instance, how much like staff like you have running on like a, what we call a virtual machine administrator or database administrator or storage administrator. And really, you can project your growth and thinking that there is an uplift that you can expect by moving to the cloud just because of the nature. There are staff that, that there are things that you won't need to do anymore into the cloud. For instance, you won't need to spend time in procuring hardware. You won't need to spend time in putting your hardware back online when there is any type of failure. You won't need like any, any type of labor part around some of the elements change within the nature of moving to the cloud. And so making sure that when building a business case, you're having a line linked to labor, that is definitely something that is, uh, uh, you know, which we, we, we suggest to keep in mind and to have it within, uh, within your build. Yeah, and I think one other thing too is like for the staff productivity piece, this is really something that you go through and when you quantify the number of whether it's engineering hours or you know the rack and stack hours, however you want to quantify that, you're really allowing developers and engineers to really focus on innovative products and innovative feature releases for the business, which is even more of a value add. It's more of like a strategic value add versus the tactical value add, which I think was on on the slide there going from from left to right. So we'll we'll touch on that more as we go through some of the other pillars. Um, one of my favorite things though about the cloud economics team, and I think I saw the link that was that was already dropped was the business case studies that are out there. So you should go check out the website and go see some of the actual numbers where customers are publicly stating, this is how AWS has helped me. I think the one on the website says that it was like 500 hours per year of server configuration time saved for staff productivity. Some of the numbers are wild and wow. they're really good case studies to go read. Yeah. Sorry if anyone sees me fidgeting as well. I'm trying to do it with my stupid slang. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Uh, so then recovery, guys. Uh, and thank you for everyone who messaged me about the shoulder. People have messaged me about it uh, following the show. So I appreciate everyone's sympathies. Um, so, uh, and yet again, going on like the devil's advocate kind of maybe aspect to it is uh, definite staff productivity can be achieved when moving to the cloud. But again, every single time with these, it's making sure that you actually do that. So if you just deploy like a lift and shift and you have, pets versus cattle, you don't really simplify that much difference from a data center. You're still having to look after those machines. So enable people to have the time to spend uh, time, to, not just lifting and shifting, but bringing those solutions into the cloud kind of framework. So taking advantage of even simple things like using auto scaling groups and, and uh, kind of automating patches or kind of using user data to install applications. The more you can give them time to develop on the cloud aspect of it, the more time they have to develop new features. So before we go into operation resiliency, we've got a question. So uh, how to change uh, business uh, people or business 
who has the who have a mindset in public cloud is more costly than running on prem? Oh, how do we change people's mindsets that public cloud is more costly than running on premise? So, Gabriel, have you got any advice for kind of how to change people's mindsets on on that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, like as part of the, it's a transition, right? So for sure, like there is an element of training and certification. And AWS has a bunch of for like a, a training and certification. You can uh, enroll your teams into it, and that's definitely the 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 first step to start kind of building uh, uh, that that kind of knowledge set and being like everyone aware of what is about to happen and how to handle this. It's a journey in the end, and so like that's definitely like the first suggestion I would recommend. Awesome. I'd also I say, so. okay, yeah. oh, go ahead, Steph, you first. No, no, I was going to say, I was going to ask you if anything you want to add. <laughs> I would just say lead with the data. You know, I, I think that there are a lot of use cases and there are a lot of workloads that make sense to to move over to cloud. And, and obviously, you know, working for AWS might be a little bit biased. And I love the devil's advocate role that you're sort of playing here, Steph. But sometimes yeah. it maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe you do want to leave a little bit there on-prem. But if you have the data and it's a data-driven approach, it should be a fairly easy sell to say, this makes sense to move over to the cloud. You're going to have all of these benefits. This business case is going to speak for itself. Millions in cost savings or million, like hundreds of hours saved on the engineering front or reduction in, in time to market, which I don't want to spoil like what business agility is. We'll, we'll go through the framework, but I think it sells itself. Like I, I think the business case, if properly done, if properly conducted, the data will be there to, to make, the, make the pitch easier. Sweet. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you for questions, guys. All right. On to our next one. Just going to throw it up on screen again. Uh, operational resiliency. Yeah. So and this one, like, already uh, implicitly tells where we are heading to because it's like here we are talking about, like, uh, uh, making sure that you track all the time and the costs linked to downtime, uh, security issue, time to recover, time to detect, like all these aspects, think about like take a time frame. And typically we suggest to build business cases over a five year time horizon. That's because like it's typically the average refresh cycle that you have for your on-premises infrastructure. And Do that you mean you can... like a five year look forward in the business case? Correct, 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 okay. correct. Five year forward, because like that will it's really allowing you to make like a like for like comparison and okay. think about how much of this you have seen in the past in terms of downtime, um, like time to recover, and make sure that you have a line within your business case of cost associated to that. Because we know that within the cloud already there is a an element of resiliency and backup and disaster recovery already embedded in some of the features, and that is that definitely some of the line item that we really suggest to keep track of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That Especially, I like that point about the five-year looking forward. And that actually links well to questions. So, Jeff, I'll throw this to you. Um, so when we're talking about this kind of operation resiliency, and in general, uh, when we're thinking about looking ahead, when we're creating this business case, so the question is, thank you for the question, are there any key data points we should have in a business case? Is there anything that jumps to mind that you could think of, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think that some of the key metrics just go across the board in, in each of the pillars. Like for cost savings, you're probably going to want to quantify the cost per server. You're probably going to want to quantify the cost per like gigabyte of, of storage. It's going to be very tactical. It's going to be very driven based off of what the each individual piece of, of hardware costs. And then it's sort of as you go through the framework, some of the other data points become a little bit harder to quantify. But some of the key things are in like the business agility and, and the resilience. How fast are you deploying features now? How fast are you, are you able to do some of the A-B testing and doing some of that benchmarking, which um, I don't know, Gabriel, if you'll talk a little bit about some of the benchmarking that Cloud Economics has, but you have a ton of good benchmarking data to say this is what the good looks like or this is some of the averages across the board. And I don't mean to put you on the spot with that, but if you want to touch on that briefly, that would be that would be great, too. Yeah, no, spot on, spot on. And, and this is really touching also on the, the fourth pillar, which is linked to business agility, right? And and that is definitely linked to all the elements that we just discussed around, okay, what is your time like to 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 develop new applications? Um, but also like broadly speaking, the business agility element and linked to we have definitely a bunch of benchmarks that we can help and feed to, to customers to understand, okay, what are what the others have achieved during these migrations. But um, when building a business case, really you should think, first of all, 
what type of applications are you uh, um, assessing? Is it like a customer facing application? Is it an internal corporate application? Is it like uh, uh, an application used to develop new products? And so start from there and think about how changing that would impact your business. Is it going to improve the customer satisfaction? Is it going to improve your retention of the employee because it's going to be a better environment to work with? Is it going to improve the way you develop new products? And that is really um, the way we think about business agility and how to track that. And it's my favorite pillar because really you get down to assessing, okay, how am I going to change and how am I going to impact the business? And really getting down to KPIs. Sometimes it's just like a cost of staff. Other times it's a bigger business, increasing revenue, improvement in margins. But that is definitely another line where you start with the costs, you move down to the, the cost of the infrastructure, you move down to the labor cost, you move down to the cost of um, downtime. And then you start thinking, okay, now, what about revenue? What about margins? What about better customer satisfaction? What about time to deploy new applications? And that is really the flow that we typically suggest to follow. Nice. Jeff, do you want to add anything about yeah how you do it normally with customers, even about the, the kind of unit cost stuff or um, anything general on around this business agility? I, I think it's also my, my favorite pillar because I think it adds like this tie-in of, of all the pillars of what the value of cloud is is really about and being agile and being able to have a dynamic environment where there wasn't a dynamic environment before on-prem and you see customer case study after customer case study there's a few like discovery the discovery channel for any mythbusters fans out there right they cut their time <laughs> to launch new services by 50 percent I think they're on the wow. cloud economics page. There's another one around Unilever, right? Launch of new products, 75% faster. These are the things that are really driving businesses and really driving some of those business outcomes. And those are the things that not just executives, but when you have these conversations, when we're talking to people who are director and VP, those are the type of metrics that they really care about. And so being able to tie the technical aspect and some of the technicality of cost savings, and this is the cost per machine, and we're going to map this type of server over to an EC2 instance and this type of storage over to EBS or S3, like you start connecting those dots and those are the types of outcomes that are really powerful. I think that's also my favorite pillar. So we're on the same page, Gabriel. Yeah, two, two things I'll, I'll add is, uh, Gabriel, I, th I think it's a really interesting point about saying like, what is this application for? Uh, sometimes I think, especially on our side, we don't always get that level of detail from our customers because it's we see it from a finance perspective rather than necessarily going in that deep. And so that's quite a good point to be like, okay, what is the goal of this specific thing you're doing and how will it look in five years time? Like, will it be a constant? Will you be adding new features to it? Or is it just something that you're going to be using kind of day to day? Like, how does that actually map? So that's really interesting. And then again, doing my advocate, my developer, developer a devil's advocate role, um, is thinking about this kind of concept of uh, ensuring that you can build quickly and fix errors quickly and enabling teams to do that is very important. You said the word agile is, is all when you think of like cloud or DevOps, all those kind of buzzwords aligned together. So making sure again that you give people time and the skill set to do that. I think people sometimes underestimate how long it takes, not long, but the effort and the the kind of time needed to upskill in cloud. If you're taking someone from racking and stacking over to, to cloud, it's a different a different landscape, a different process. And so giving people education in what and how to develop code. So not doing things manually, doing it with infrastructure as code. So when you need to change something, it's nice and easy. But also when it comes to cost optimization, educating people on what does it actually mean to be cost optimized in the cloud. They might not know that you should be using GP3. They might not know that there is a thing called intelligent tiering or lifecycle policies should be enabled for dumb things like delete markers and MPUs in your buckets. They might not have that information to hand when they first start doing that. And unless you tell them to do that, that's kind of going off the business case track. But I just wanted to bring that up. But when it comes to your business case, what I would say as well is to maybe add thinking about how you will take that education and, and that business agility kind of combine them together so that they will enable you to do this, but how will you utilize that? Before we jump onto the last one, I'm gonna obviously throw this coming up. Nice hat collection. Thank you very much. It's new, I've had it on the cup. I've been meaning to talk about it, but no one's asked. So uh, this person has, so thank you. Uh, it's actually all free hats that I've received from events. So if anyone wants to send me a hat to have featured on the show, any third parties out there, I'd be happy to have it. <laughs> Send me a swag pack. 
uh, I'll throw up my email, email customization at amazon.com or <laughs> comment below i haven't said that as well if you're watching on youtube don't forget to subscribe and drop a like on the video and let us know have you got a hat collection have you got any collection <laughs> or are you using business uh, uh a business case value for moving to the cloud right on to our last one with about five minutes to go uh sustainability uh kind of best to last so considering that in a business case gabriel take it away yeah can i say it's my favorite one of that as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um that 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 line item is really aiming when building a business case at assessing the improvement in terms of carbon emissions that you bring home by by moving to the cloud so how to to do that like really start to to think about what's your your power consumption of your current infrastructure mainly if you want to keep it easy and 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 uh, think about how you are procuring your your current power and whether it's you are procuring from your national grid or from any type of plant but when moving to the cloud you know what's your baseline so you know how much power you are consuming and you know the amount of co2 equivalent linked to that power consumption and think that when you're moving to the cloud there are at least three levers of benefits that you get just by moving. And the first one is by the nature of the public cloud being multi-tenant, the utilization of the assets is increased. So just by keeping the same power consumption, there is a better utilization of the assets. Second part is that AWS have invested a lot to build like the uh, most efficient uh, uh, data centers. And so the power usage effectiveness, the PUE is actually really good within within AWS. And so the power consumption is really optimized. And then the, the third element is that we're really uh, um, powering as much as possible our data center with, with, with renewable energy. And so you bring home all these three benefits just with the move. And so that is really another element that we want to make sure that you keep within, like you keep track within, um, within building uh, your assessment. Amazing. And uh, Jeff, uh, sustainability, do you often talk to customers about this, about gr green ops, I think is the term I see a lot of people start to throw about. I think, I think we do at a high level. We, we, we will talk about just how it makes sense and how where this intersection of, of optimization and sustainability kind of cross is using what you need and, and turning it off when you don't. I mean, it just makes fundamental sense that you're going to be more sustainable. You're going to have a bigger impact whenever you have the ability to scale up these instances when you need them and scale them down when you don't. We're not using that power. And then mm -hmm. if you check out the AWS website on sustainability. It gives it a lot of benchmarks it gives a lot of data points some of which you know gabriel was talking about around how much renewable energy we're using trying to be net carbon neutral i think by 2040 there's some sustainability data initiatives the climate pledge there's a ton of information on the public website um i don't know if i, I put the link in the chat or the private yeah, chat if we could share that out then yeah. that'd be great go take a look there and and read up on some of the things that we're doing as a whole as as a company to, to try and help out too Awesome. All right. So we've got a question in the chat. So I'm just going to sum, which is off this topic, but I will answer it. Uh, so just to summarize, I'll also add for sustainability. I know I'm an optimization show, but sometimes developers care more about sustainability. So push that out there. Really do speak to that sustainability. If you want to learn more, Mark Butcher, a shout out to my buddy. Uh, find him on LinkedIn. He produces a lot of great content on this. Uh, just had a question, how to cost optimize CloudWatch, especially related to logs. So I'll just summarize in one sentence. The more logs you put into CloudWatch, the more you pay. So check if you're in debug mode for any of your applications. Check if you have control of your logs and could you kind of shorten them down into what data is actually needed. And also check, do you actually need to put it into CloudWatch or could you put audit or kind of compl compliance logs into S3. Um, in the show notes, I will add the link to the YouTube video all about CloudWatch optimization. I'm rushing because we've got less than a minute to go. Um, uh, I'll add the link. So that listener, all feel free if you have a specific question, email me at costoptimization@amazon.com or put more questions in the chat on YouTube. All right, I'll just flash this up on screen quickly. So if you're building a business case, remember to check out these pillars. We've popped some links in the below so you can check out how to learn more. And that is gonna be it from us. Last thing I'll say is um, next week, we are talking all about 
cost optimization of QuickSight. So we talk a lot about QuickSight with the cloud intelligence dashboards. That's probably the latest I've ever mentioned the dashboards uh, in a YouTube video for this because they come <laughs> up constantly. Um, so uh, if you are a QuickSight user for the dashboards, then check out next week. That'll be our last episode of the season before we take a little hiatus. So thank you so much for watching and we'll see you all next